My name is John Mann. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Nationwide Children's Hospital, The Ohio State University College of Medicine. And our topic for today is X-linked hypophosphatemia, an uncommon but treatable disorder. We're gonna talk about common symptoms for an uncommon disease, X-linked hypophosphatemia, or as I'll refer to it during this presentation, XLH. XLH is a uh, X-linked hereditary progressive and lifelong disorder of renal phosphate wasting. The key element is the renal phosphate wasting, which is present uh, at birth and continues throughout life. It is by far the most common form of hereditable hypophosphatemic rickets. And it's been known by patients and healthcare professionals by a number of different uh, terms over the years. You may have heard terms like X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets, hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets, X-linked rickets, X-linked vitamin D resistant rickets, familial hypophosphatemic rickets. There's a number of terms in the literature. And over the last decade or so, investigators and scholars have really coalesced around this term X-linked hypophosphatemia because it really describes the major defect, which is the low blood phosphorus levels related to the renal wasting and the fact that it's an X-linked disorder. And we'll talk about that. The estimated prevalence is about one in 20,000 to one in 25,000 individuals in, um, uh, in the United States. And they're thought to be somewhere in the range of 12,000 to 16,000 XLH patients alive today in the United States. Uh, there's very little data on variability between populations uh, uh, in other countries or even in parts of the United States. We know the hallmark of X-linked hypophosphatemia is the presence of excess circulating levels in the blood of, of a important hormone, FGF23. As we'll talk about, this is a phosphaturic hormone. It's devoted to causing renal wasting of phosphorus, and it's really part of our regulatory uh, homeostatic mechanisms to maintain serum calcium and serum phosphorus in the desirable ranges. In this condition, high levels of FDF23 are the problem and are driving the process. We've now come to learn that it's not a defect of FGF23 gene in particular, but a defect of something that regulates FGF23 production, which is called the FEX gene. Uh, FEX stands for phosphate regulating endopeptidase homolog X linked. That's what FEX stands for. And in the individuals with X linked hypophosphatemia, there is a loss of function mutation that leads to excess FGF23. So FGF23 is not broken down appropriately, so high circulating levels uh, persist. And the common symptoms and signs of this uncommon disease are really a result of having low phosphorus levels in the blood and all of the downstream effects of that. In children, that involves symptoms like delayed walking and leg pain and uh, clear signs of, of bone abnormalities, uh, such as rickets, which would be uh, evidenced by uh, enlargement of growth plates and metaphyses in the knees and wrists in particular, but also disproportionate or impaired growth and craniosynostosis. These symptoms can present as early as the first year of life, and particularly as these kids start to walk is when we notice uh, the, the rickets changes in the legs, the bowing, uh, in particular, that occurs as uh, these uh, soft bones, so to speak, are, are, are now undergoing stress of walking. In adults, we've come to appreciate that X-linked hypophosphatemia continues to take its toll. So this is not a condition that gets better over time, but continues to have clinical consequences. And in fact, we've now come to recognize in adults with XLH, many of them are disabled because of their musculoskeletal problems. They continue to have fractures and these things called pseudo fractures, which are little uh, hairline fractures through the cortex of the bone, not complete through and through fractures. But these individuals have an increased incidence of osteoarthritis. They can have little osteophytes form at uh, some of their bone surfaces. They can have enthesopathy, which is uh, inflammation and irritation where tendons um, join bone. And they can develop other uh, significant problems like spinal stenosis, nephrocalcinosis, and hearing loss. And then lastly, we see a number of symptoms and signs that really cross between the children and the adults. Uh, we see gait abnormalities, bone and joint pain and stiffness, muscle problems, in particular weakness, 
and diminished quality of life in both children and adults with this condition. And as this condition continues through childhood, these kids do not grow normally on average. So short stature becomes a problem as well as lower limb deformities because of abnormal bone formation, fractures, and things like osteomalacia, dental abscesses and caries, which are part of this condition, and an increased incidence of curare malformation and frontal bossing. So you can see that although these are uh, by themselves signs and symptoms that can be caused by a lot of different conditions, they really uh, characterize a condition that has significant impact on these children and adults in terms of quality of life, in particular, their musculoskeletal functioning. And as I mentioned, FGF23 is, is the bad actor. Uh, this is a circulating protein, about 250 amino acids with an N-terminal region that is, contains the active a molecule. It's an FGF homology domain. Uh, and then a novel uh, C-terminus that has phosphaturic activity that really leads to the phosphate wasting in the kidney. And it does that by regulating the proximal tubular phosphate resorbers, uh, the sodium phosphate 2A and 2C transporters, and in effect down-regulating the expression of these tubular resorbers, leading to phosphate loss in the urine. The predominant source of FGF23 in humans is by osteocytes in response to phosphorus levels circulating uh, uh, around and uh, near the osteocytes. Uh, but there is also uh, evidence that FGF23 can be secreted from uh, areas of the brain uh, and the thymus. The crucial role of the excess FGF23 is important to uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of focus on as we understand this disease and the symptoms and signs, but ultimately also the treatment options we have. As I mentioned, the low phosphorus is the key, and the elevated FGF23 is the reason for this low phosphorus. As a result of the low phosphorus, what we see uh, is the downregulation of these sodium phosphate tubular resorbers in the proximal tubule, leading to renal phosphate wasting. At the same time, high levels of FGF23 decrease the production of 125 vitamin D in the proximal tubules. It actually downregulates the 1 hydroxylase enzyme, leading to less 125D, which then causes less GI absorption of phosphorus in the gut. The combination of increased urine losses and decreased GI absorption leads to the abnormal low serum phosphorus and the attendant defective mineralization, delayed ossification, uh, delayed growth, and other findings in these individuals. So what we've come to appreciate uh, with XLH is uh, really that this is a uh, FGF23 mediated disease. Uh, and as we'll talk about, uh, we can understand this condition through that lens and really talk about what uh, are reasonable ways to help these patients uh, have their disease managed and have a better life. So in summary, XLH is a lifelong progressive disorder of phosphate wasting in the kidney driven by elevated levels of FGF23. These uh, individuals with X-linked hypophosphatemia uh, will have manifestations throughout the life cycle uh, and continue to have a significant burden from this condition. So thank you for attending uh, this session uh, and we appreciate your uh, involvement.